Thank you for joining us today for the Borlaug Cast Communication Presentation Program. I am Kent Shesky and I serve as the Executive Vice President of CAST, the Council for Agriculture Science and Technology. It is my privilege to be your host and moderator for today's program. CAST is fortunate to have such a great opportunity to present this award as a key side event as a part of the World Food Prize for the last 11 years. This year's World Food Prize Borlaug Dialogue is being held as a virtual event, we are pleased to again be a part of this important gathering of leaders, scholars, and hunger fighters. It is my pleasure now to introduce Barbara Stinson, president of the World Food Prize Foundation, to share some greetings and congratulations to this year's BCCA recipient. Barbara. Today, it is my pleasure to congratulate this year's Borlaug Cast Communication Award winner. This award is presented annually for outstanding achievement by a scientist, engineer, technologist, or other professional working in agriculture, environmental work, with food sectors, or for contributing to the advancement of science and public policy. For the last 10 years, this award has been featured as a part of the International Borlaug Dialogue. We're thrilled to continue that partnership. My special congratulations go to this year's winner, Alexa Lamb. Alexa is an Associate Professor of Science Communication at the University of Georgia. With a long list of achievements as a scientist, educator, and writer, Dr. Lamb is recognized nationally and internationally as a research scholar. She's known as a skilled translator with a way of making technology and science accessible for all. Dr. Lamb is the 11th winner of the award. And we so appreciate this award for its recognition of our hero, Dr. Norman E. Borlaug, the man who fed the world and the author of the first cast publication. Congratulations again to Dr. Lamb, and thank you so much for your dedication to science and communication. Thank you, Barbara. CAS was formed in 1972 to provide unbiased, credible science-based information about food and agriculture to policymakers, the media, the private sector, and the public. CAST is a membership-based nonprofit organization comprised of scientific and professional societies, other nonprofit organizations, universities, companies, and many individuals. It is through this, next slide please. It is through this network of members and member organizations that we select our topics for CAST publications, as well as access a network of scientists, economists, engineers, and other subject matter specialists who produce, help produce those papers. Next slide. CAST has a small staff located in Ames, Iowa. Much of the work that CAST produces is through volunteers who serve on our governing boards, task forces that compile and write our papers and reviewers to make sure our papers are unbiased and based upon sound science. Over the past 13 years, we've involved over 1,500 subject matter specialists who graciously volunteer their time, energy, and expertise to help us accomplish this work. Next slide. Our publications and information are intended for audiences of policymakers, the media, the private sector, public, and educators. We do this to help increase the accessibility, awareness, and understanding of the science and technology and innovation that is so critical to food and agriculture. If you visit our website, you will see we have several different types of CAST publications. Most popular are CAST issue papers and commentaries. We also produce an quick CAST for each of our papers that serves as an easy to use guide, executive summary for key information. We've also recently introduced the student study guide, which we hope will be used by students and teachers to learn more about food, current food and agricultural issues. Next slide. The use of social media is an important part of our science communication efforts, and I join you to join us on any of these platforms. Just a reminder that today's webinar is being recorded. Toward the end of our main presentation, we'll post a message that the chat box is open for you to submit questions to our featured speaker. Next slide. We are here today to honor the recipient of the 2020 Borla CAS Communication Award given annually by CAS to a scientist, engineer, technologist or other professional who demonstrates a passionate interest in communicating the importance of agriculture to policymakers, news media, and the public. It was originally dedicated to Charles A. Black, one of the founders of CAST, 
and his first executive vice president, and then later to Dr. Norman E. Borlaug, who was a strong supporter of CAST and the author of CAST's first publication. The presentation gift is a, is a bronze globe that was custom designed for CAST by noted art, artist and sculptor Jerry Palin. The spherical bands bear the words agriculture, science, and technology, while the base is inscribed with a phrase that captures the essence of agriculture, a world supported by plants and animals. These are the, the from 1986 to 2009, the Charles A. Black Award recognized early pioneers for their efforts to communicate the science and technology and innovation of food and agriculture. Next slide. Then from 2010 to current, the, in 2009-10, the award was renamed in honor of Dr. Borlaug. CASP has also during this time recognized 10 additional outstanding science communicators. I'm very pleased that last year, at last year's World Food Prize, we had the opportunity to celebrate some of the, the work of some of our past participants as a part of the program. Next slide. CAS is very pleased once again to have the Crop Life Foundation as a sponsor of the 2020 Borlaug CAS Communication Award. The Crop Life Foundation sponsored this award from 2010 to 2012 when the activity first became a part of the World Food Prize. And they're now it's honored to have them support it once again. They clearly demonstrate their understanding of the importance of, commu of communications about science and technology that is critical to our modern food and agricultural system. Join us today is Julie Borlaug of the Crop Life Foundation Board of Directors. Julie is Vice President for Communications and Public Relations with Inari Agriculture, Inc., and also Dr. Borlaug's granddaughter. She serves on the CAS Board of Trustees. Welcome, Julie. Hi, good morning, and thank you, or good afternoon, I'm sorry. Thank you for having me, and I wish we were all together. Um, it'd actually be morning, that's why I said morning. If we were all together in Iowa, it'd be like 7 a.m. right now. So this is actually great timing. But um, sorry we're not together this year, and we know we'll be back together next year, but I just want to thank CAST for always doing this important role. Um, I speak a lot about communications, and I know, and we all know the importance of communicating what agriculture is, why it's important, and how we can get regulatory bodies and the public behind us and supporting what really needs to be done to feed the world in a way that's sustainable and handles great challenges like climate change. So I'm excited that Dr. Lamb has won the award this year, and congratulations. She's, as you've heard her background from the University of Georgia, she's made science accessible to all, which is so important. And she's done it through traditional and non-traditional um, avenues. Um, and that's something I've always really appreciated about the CAST Forlog Award, because it's not people just writing, it's people who sing songs about agriculture to make them more comprehensible. That's one of our past laureates. We've had people who great on Twitter and so many different avenues, and that's what we all have to do. My grandfather, our last words were take it to the farmer. And I always add, take it to the public. So it's so great to have someone who's studying social science research and, and how decisions are made through extension. And um, it's also great to have another female as a member of the Borlaug cast laureate team. So I'd like to congratulate Dr. Lamb once again. I think when we talk about communications and um, understanding how to do it effectively, I think we've got a great opportunity here in this year this is the 50th anniversary of my grandfather's Nobel Peace Prize. We had the Nobel Peace Prize awarded to World Food Program. So once again, the world is seeing that access peace and all the potential that agriculture can do. And then we had the Nobel Chemistry uh, given to Dr. Doudna, who is working on CRISPR technology, which will be revolutionary in how we use it with gene editing and um, bringing technologies into the future. So this has been a great time to communicate about all these wins in agriculture. And we, the, um, the Crop Life Foundation, are happy to support this award every year. And as I said, I ask everyone to continue to take it to the public. And thank you for having me, Ken. Thank you, Julie. We appreciate your involvement. And, and I think you know your presence and sharing the connection of this award to your grandfather's legacy is always a highlight of our program. And thank you to the CropLife Foundation uh, for their work in sponsoring this award. 
In any recognition event, the selection of award recipient begins with the consideration of a number of worthy candidates or nominees. CAST is fortunate that each year we receive many outstanding nominations, each of whom would be deserving in some way for this prestigious award. The responsibility for naming the recipient is taken very seriously by a selection committee. Comprised of several members of the CAST Board of Directors, the committee carefully evaluates, reviews, and discusses the qualifications of each of the nominated individuals before making its final decision. The announcement of that decision was shared publicly in a virtual event we held this past April. This year's award winner was nominated by the University of Georgia. We're very pleased to have with us today Dr. Nick Place, the incoming Dean for the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources at the University to introduce this year's winner. Dr. Place. Well, thank you, Kent. I appreciate that introduction and uh, very happy to be with you here today and very happy to be introducing um, our award winner, Dr. Um, Alexa Lamb. So Dr. Lamb started her career working as a 4-H agriculture extension agent in Colorado about a de uh, for almost a decade. And uh, she has shared with me that it was during this time that she really had an opportunity and took it upon herself to figure out how to communicate complex scientific concepts to diverse agriculture audiences that had very diverse needs. And she developed a strong interest in telling the story of e extension and the science coming out of the land grant university system. Now at the University of Georgia and previously at the University of Florida where I really got to know her quite well, Dr. Lamb's science has focused on building expertise around how people make decisions about agricultural topics. Therefore, while most scientists focused on a singular topic area, she has had the unique uh, opportunity to study and develop a picture of what influences public perception around almost every aspect of agricultural sciences ranging from water conservation water quality and climate change, to food safety, genetic modification, and immigration reform. Her academic success is proven by her track record. In addition to teaching several science communication graduate level courses and mentoring dozens of graduate students and postdoctoral associates, she has published over 165 peer-reviewed journal articles and has been on grant teams garnering over $46 million in support of, of funding agencies, including the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the National Science Foundation, the National Inst Institutes of Health, the Center for Disease Control, and the World Bank. Dr. Lamb has given over 100 presentations, uh, worked in more than uh, 32 countries, and has been interviewed by state, national, and international news syndicates on numerous occasions. Even more important is her passion for helping other scientists communicate their work. One of her recommenders for this award shared her ability to draw scientific information out of the most tenaciously guarded researcher and partner with them to communicate their findings to the general consumer and public is inspiring and necessary. Since starting as an extension agent about uh, 20 years ago, Dr. Lamb's research findings, extension initiatives, and teaching efforts have resulted in policy changes associated with water conservation and local food initiatives, impacted how extension communicates its larger impact, and enhanced interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research teams around the globe. And it's for all these reasons that uh, we're really proud to present Dr. Alexa Lamb with the 2020 Borlaug Cast Communication Award, and also why um, I'm very proud to call her a fellow colleague at the University of Georgia. Uh, Dr. Lamb, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Place, for that kind introduction. I'm thrilled to be here with all of you discussing how to communicate science during times of crisis. Before we get started, I would like to thank the CAST Board of Directors and the Crop Life Foundation for their support of science communication and promotion of this award. 
I'd also like to thank all of the scientists I've had the pleasure of working with. Amazing innovations and new technologies are being developed and tested in colleges of agriculture and environmental science around the world. And I've enjoyed every moment of trying to help make these breakthroughs relevant and applicable to those that will use them to solve a myriad of global issues. Finally, I'd like to thank my family for their unwavering support and especially my husband, Kevin, that I get to work side by side with as a faculty member at the University of Georgia. He pushes me each and every day to think bigger than I thought possible and I can't thank him enough for believing in me. But we are gathered here today to discuss how to effectively communicate science in times of crisis. And being the backbone of all civilization, agriculture and the environment is almost always at the center or impacted by every crisis and can be informed by science. It's during times of crisis that people become insecure and uncertain and seek the answers to a myriad of questions. Forest fires run rampant. The producer asks, how can I get the crops out of my field in time? The public asks, should I evacuate and risk losing everything? Avian flu strikes. The producer asks, what should I do with my flock? The public wonders, can I still get chicken in the store? And is it safe to eat? A global pandemic hits. We all ask, should I wear a mask? Can I send my kids to school? What food can we safely eat? Is it safely inspected? Does coronavirus transfer on packaging? It's during times of crisis when we ask ourselves so many questions and when we want to be able to turn to science to answer those questions. Unfortunately, the science isn't always available and that is largely the fault of the scientific community. When the science isn't available or we don't know where to find it, we become dependent upon what we can find, often pseudoscience and or misinformation. Research has shown that times of stress are when we rely most heavily on our natural cognitive tendencies. It's during these times of stress that is also the most, most important to think critically. Critical thinking is necessary when there is no right or wrong, black or white answer or solution. And it's during times of crisis, like the one we're living through right now, that clear-cut solutions are few and far between. Research I've conducted throughout the years resulting in an instrument that measures critical thinking disposition, the UFCTI, which is showcased on this slide, tells us that people have a natural tendency to either engage with others through conversation or seek information when thinking. This occurs on a continuum with people exhibiting a preference for one disposition or the other. COVID-19 has impacted those who naturally engage with others to obtain information and think critically the most. They are less capable of engaging directly with others and therefore have become reliant on social media to make connections and feel engaged. However, there are no controls on social media the way there are on mainstream media, making it difficult to discern empirically based science from pseudoscience. For those who seek information, the amount of information available has made it even more difficult to discern empirically based science from pseudoscience or misinformation. The World Health Organization recently named this concept an infodemic. We are constantly bombarded with information passively and must be selective about what we take in and what we toss. We often do this unconsciously. However, in times of crisis, we seek out information more rapidly than usual. Here is data from a recent study we conducted in my lab in May of 2020 when most states were still under shelter in place orders to see how people were consuming information and how that impacted their perceptions of scientific information. As you can see, Americans were using mainstream media to a great degree. For example, the National Center for Disease Control Information was accessed at least once a day by over 50% of those surveyed. 
there was not a single respondent in our data set that did not access at least one mainstream news source daily during this time. We also examined social media use, as this is where people go to socialize and fulfill their desires to engage with others when face-to-face -face contact is not possible. Facebook was used by over 70% of Americans at least once a day and 30% almost constantly. So the public is there seeking information in times of crisis. What information are they using to answer their questions and take action? Our minds filter information automatically. This is based on our cognitive makeup, our prior experiences and knowledge, and our basic need to function. So how does scientific information make it to the top of the list when people are seeking information? First and foremost, scientists must prioritize communicating so the information is available. But there are four things to consider to make it through the funnel we all use to make science usable in times of crisis. Here is a model to assist in conceptualizing how the four concepts I deem essential to communicating in times of crisis interact. Specific audiences need different messages displayed through specific channels from the right source. If we can do this, we can get through the funnel. I'll talk about each a little more specifically. First, we must know our audience. Meredith Hill once said, if you speak to everyone, you speak to no one. These words are the foundation of successful marketing campaigns across the world and have permeated mainstream advertising as well as advertising on social media. Why do you think companies pay Facebook for targeted advertising? Because it works and is rarely used by scientists. Let me give you some examples. Meet Molly. She represents the primary grocery purchaser in the United States. She is white and over the age of 30. She cares deeply about what other moms think of her and her decision-making around what she feeds her kids. This social norm plays a strong role in her food purchases. Molly represents the group most concerned about the use of face masks in public, and she and her friends are quarantining as much as possible during COVID-19. Her family is most probably ordering food rather than going out to restaurants. And if she lives in a high socioeconomic status area, she's probably using food delivery services such as Instacart to deliver her groceries. She cares deeply about health policy and reform and is very concerned about food safety during the pandemic. Prior to COVID-19, she and her friends are part of the largest group of consumers influenced by the GMO labeling debate and supports the organic, all-natural movement. She, like others in her demographic, pays little attention to the National News Syndicate or the National Public Radio, but frequents Facebook and Instagram. This is where she gets most of her information. Now meet Brian and Melissa. They are members of the generation with the largest purchasing power in history. They probably just entered the workforce, may have just purchased their first home, and are thinking about starting a family. They are both socially conscious and feel strongly connected to their local communities, including the local food system, but are still undecided about whether or not food labels matter, if they really care about where their food comes from, and how environmentally conscious they want to be. Their friends often debate these concepts and social norms have not yet been established. But don't be fooled. Brian and Melissa's purchasing decisions, along with the rest of their millennial and Gen Z counterparts, will guide future food policy and marketing decisions, and they are expected to engage fully in the democratic process. They are active on Instagram and Snapchat, and if they have a problem, they turn to YouTube for a video that will show them how to solve it.
We just discussed two major target audiences for food messaging, what matters to them and where they go for information. They are worlds apart and both equally important as are many other groups. This is why getting to know your audience is the foundation for sharing science. Now let's discuss the message. Messaging is important in an area scientists often mess up when trying to communicate with one another, decision makers, and the public. We overuse jargon, including acronyms. We make things extremely complex, wanting every detail included, and we rarely use visual cues leaning heavily on statistics. These are all mistakes, as most Americans spend less than 30 seconds on an individual piece of information available online, including video. So the elevator speech is more important than ever. But what the message says is important too, and the visual cues you use matters. I'm gonna give you an example from a recent study we conducted regarding citrus. Those of you from citrus producing areas are probably very familiar with citrus greening and its dramatic decimation of the citrus industry. A crisis, no doubt. I was on a USDA funded team searching for solutions to citrus greening. Amazing scientists were testing multiple ways to treat citrus greening and developing brilliant treatments. But if public acceptance was limited and no one bought the orange juice produced from the scientifically modified tree, then the treatments really weren't a solution to the crisis. Therefore, my team was charged with determining the best way to communicate the science to help save the citrus industry. After six years of research using surveys and focus groups across the US to introduce and get feedback on scientific treatments, we found public levels or latitudes of acceptance regarding spraying, using viruses to infect a citrus tree, tree to become resistant to the disease, and transgenic modification of citrus trees was very low among the public. However, our findings revealed that consumers want messaging about the safety of food produced by GM science rather than the science itself. In addition, they were most interested in how GM science impacted the quality of their food, the impact it had on the environment, and to a small degree, the impact it had on farmers. We were using the wrong messaging. So no wonder their acceptance was low. It wasn't getting through their funnel. I had the opportunity to talk with the scientists who developed the first genetically modified papaya that saved that industry in Hawaii when I was there giving a talk on the importance of science communication a couple of years ago. They said, if they knew what we know now about getting out in front of an issue before it became a crisis, they would have communicated more proactively about what they were doing to save the papaya industry and could have saved a lot of time fighting battles that were unnecessary after the fact. Using the right message to get in front of a potential crisis is important. So now let's discuss the channel. Now that we know our audience and have chosen a message that will resonate, you need to use the channel your audience is using. Scientists often rely on websites. Don't get me wrong, it's necessary to have a web presence to link to from other sources but should not be the primary channel of communication. It's just too passive in the latest communication space. Then we have the associated press, mainstream media. The problem with using the associated press is you really need someone to assist in the translation of scientific information. So use your communication staff. They know how to get word out there on the AP. The information most typically picked up is that that's associated with a brand. So using your university or your company or your nonprofit labeling can really help when you're trying to get information out through mainstream media. In addition, partnering across those groups can also be very useful. Then of course there's, yeah, we've got Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, and a myriad of others that seem to come and go. It feels overwhelming, and it is difficult to maintain a presence on more than one channel, maybe two. 
It is very tempting to repeat content on multiple channels, but all of the research shows that audiences are resistant to repeated content, so I would encourage you to avoid it. Picking up a following on social media is probably the hardest part, getting people to listen and to follow what you're doing. You can use influencers to your advantage because reposting is just as important as initial posting. Now, social media can suck up all of your time. So you wanna use your analytics to your advantage to see what type of information is getting your message out there, being reposted, being used the most. But you also wanna use your setup tools within your social media platforms so that you can put your information out there once a month or every few months and it will auto-populate throughout the month and you don't have to do it every day. I also want to mention podcasts and vodcasts. People are listening on their walks, their drives. We're seeing more traffic pick up on these mediums during the COVID-19 shelter in place orders than ever before. But you do need a hook to get them to subscribe. Again, it's about the followers. And you can use influencers here to help you. Once you have someone who is influential in a social circle, they will get others hooked on what you have to offer. Our recent research also revealed that during the COVID-19 crisis, when most states were under that shelter in place order, people who were more highly educated were more likely to use Facebook and the World Health Organization to seek information than those with less education. However, age also had a significant relationship with media use. The older someone was, the less likely they were to engage with Instagram and Fox News. Of course, there were other characteristics at play like political ideology and affiliation, geographic location, but you can see the channels diverse audiences are using and it is important to think about that audience and where they are so you can meet them there. Now let's discuss the last piece of the puzzle, the source. The right person delivering the message matters but we often don't think about this. When sharing information about food and environmental systems, people may not picture a scientist or a representative of a university, yet this is how we typically communicate science. Think about your audience. We pay the most attention to people who look, think, and talk like us. Social norms play a major role in trust and the belief a relationship exists. People must trust the deliverer of a message for it to get through the funnel. So it's important to spend some time thinking about who your audience will relate to, who they expect to obtain information from, and use that person to deliver the message or at a minimum, capitalize on their networks and have them share your science on their networks. That's the power of influencers once again. In a study a few years ago, I worked with the Florida Farm Bureau and a group of scientists to examine how source credibility impacted public trust in agriculture's use of water. They had implemented a new program focused on getting farmers to engage in best management practices and wanted to know best how to communicate with the public to garner additional purchasing support for those farms. They wanted to know this so that they could encourage other farmers to join the initiative, improving the number that were engaged in best management practices and taking care of the environment. So they thought partnering with the Nature Conservancy might improve public attitude and trust in the farming community. So we developed and tested video messages about the impact of farmers engagement in agricultural best management practices on the water quality in Florida. Four identical videos were used, as you can see here, with only the source altered in the description of Ricky Wayne on screen and the logo on the last frame. The video treatments were then randomly assigned to respondents and trust was tested. We used a farmer, a regulator from a water management district, a university scientist, and a representative of the Nature Conservancy to see which would elicit the highest level of trust. 
In this case, the farmer garnered significantly more public trust than the other treatment, and public perceptions were highest when information was delivered by either the university scientist or the farmer. Once again, it is in times of crisis the public needs science the most. And in the absence of trusted scientific sources, they will use what they can get, often pseudoscience or misinformation. To be the most effective and ensure scientific information gets through the funnel when crisis hits, we can focus on these four things. I'll quickly summarize the takeaways. Identify your audience first, be specific and get to know them. Create tailored, clear, concise messages that avoid jargon. Meet your audiences where they are by using the right channel and be proactive rather than passive. Mirror your audience to build credibility, strong relationships, and trust. Just as Dr. Borlaug stated, there are no miracles in agricultural production. There are no miracles in communicating the science behind it. It takes hard work and perseverance and direction. There is no single solution, especially in times of crisis. But we can also draw inspiration from what Dr. Borlaug, from Dr. Borlaug, who also said, institutions have the moral obligation to serve agriculture and society also, and to discharge that obligation honorably they must try to help educate scientists and scientific leaders whose primary motivation is to serve humanity. Science communication serves humanity. Thank you for listening today. Again, I'm thrilled to be able to share my thoughts with all of you and be the recipient of this wonderful recognition. I would once again like to thank the CAST Board of Directors and Crop Life Foundation for their support. If you are interested in learning more about the research you've heard about today, here are the references. This was just a snapshot of all the public perception work we've been engaged in. And I would welcome any conversations to advance this area of expertise. I would be happy to take any questions at this time. Alexa, thank you very much for that presentation. And we do have some questions that we have been receiving and I'll share those to you and give you a chance to, to share it. This question comes from one of our scientists who's watching today. Who can I turn to help them more uh, more effectively communicate their science? What would be your that, Yeah, that is a great question and one I get often. Um, there's actually a whole field of science communication experts, um, agricultural communicators out there um, permeating most of the land grant university system. Um, and it's a growing field. So there are more and more of us out there that would love to partner on teams, conduct research on how to effectively communicate the science coming out of innovative interdisciplinary teams. Um, so I would encourage all of them to look at their colleges of ag, um, primarily in departments like mine, which is the Agricultural Leadership Education and Communication Department, um, because there are agricultural communicators that study this work. Good. Second question we had was, can you discuss your recent research on using animated infographics to help consumers recall information? Yeah, absolutely. We did do a recent study that was just published last month in the Journal of Applied Communications, examining um, the animation of infographics, specifically around genetic modification conversations. Um, and what we found was that animating does draw more attention. It does increase perceptions of the information, um, but the recall itself is not emphasized as by animating those. So we can, we can grab attention, but the amount of information that's held by the individual doesn't, isn't really different from um, the static infographics. So as we're thinking about sharing media online and the animation of media, um, we need to think about what we're trying to accomplish. Are we trying to influence um, attention and, and grabbing people's attention, or are we trying to influence knowledge? And in this case, it was about genetic modification, which is a, an interesting topic to 
there and have consumers digest because people, most people have already made up their minds about how they feel about genetic modification. And so it's very hard to get through that filter. It's even harder to get through that funnel with this topic than most uh, because large, largely people ignore that type of information because they've already made decisions. So in this case, animating those infographics didn't make as much of a difference on recall as we thought that it would, that we hypothesized. Here's another question from one of our viewers. Um, when we think about consumers, um, how many different perspectives, uh, publications, other media sources, that do they seek out to, to get different perspectives on an issue? Um, and the other part of this question is, is uh, how are they referencing science or science translated uh, documents like our CAS publications? Uh, could you comment kind of on how people are viewing or, or how they're kind of verifying different perspectives on science? Sure, I can't speak directly to the CAS publications as I don't know um, your audience and I haven't seen those analytics to be able to uh, really speak to that. What I can tell you is that when we have studied where the public is going to check the credibility of information, so if they're consuming a piece of scientific information, they want to check to see whether others agree with that information, if it's also being shared on social media, um, they do tend to go to people that they rely on every day. So it's like those people who hold value to myself. For me, that would be my family and that would be the other people that I work closely with. Um, and so in my case, other agricultural communicators. Um, but the general public is seeking sources like their family members, their friends whom they think have a high level of knowledge to affirm the information that they're reading. So the amount of fact checking that's going on um, is, it's more related to social norms and social conversations than actually looking for a multitude of sources online to verify scientific information. Thank you. Um, another question came in from one of our viewers. What's your favorite form of media to help communicate science? That's a great question and it's changed over time. Um, as we all know, the communication platforms available to us today are very different from those just a year ago, which are very different from five, 10 years ago. So when I started as an extension agent, you know, back when I first graduated from college, I would have told you our newsletter that was sent out in the mail. Um, and then I would have gone to email. Uh, these days, to be completely honest with you, my favorite form of media to use is online is to share short videos, 15 to 30 second videos that are very directed in their messages and have visual cues that get people engaged and interested. Um, so yeah, that's my favorite way to transfer information right now. We, are, we do know that 80% of the information being utilized online right now is through video format. I guess the follow-on question to that, what are the, some of the, the social media platforms that, were, that probably fit that description the best? I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? What are the, what are the different social media platforms that can be used to, to, to do that type of communication? What are the most effective ones? For video communication or just most effective in general? Most effective for that short video form that you discussed. Yeah, I would definitely say um, that Facebook is a very good way to be sharing video content. Um, I like to use short social media posts that push people to um, web pages that have video content. Um, obviously, YouTube is a video based platform, and so embedding um, video, YouTube videos into other social media posts and platforms is also very useful. Question regarding one of your comments earlier, what tips do you have for communication professionals who work with university researchers? There seems to be a constant battle between trying to get people's attention and including all the information. Oh man, that is a challenge. I agree 100%. Uh, it is a fine line. 
I find that sitting down and talking about what people will consume and what they won't uh, with a researcher using credible evidence-based science information out of the social science discipline, like the work that I do really helps them see that there is a science to communicating. Um, and really, if we are putting together a one page uh, handout and all it is is numbers and statistics that people will not understand at first glance, it's not gonna be effective. They're not gonna utilize it. And I can show them the scientific evidence that if we can break that down into very simple infographics, we can at least capture their attention and transfer some of that information. Of course, it's disappointing that we can't tell everyone everything. But if we can start the conversation and get people interested in our science, then we can progressively move them to more advanced topics. But yeah, that is definitely one of the biggest challenges is trying to identify the information that really needs to be transferred related to everything that could be transferred. You said repeated messages or a, that repeated message is not helpful. Audiences often resist repeated message, especially if they don't agree. But on the other end of uh, other end, reposting on social media has impact. Um, isn't reposting just repeating messages? <laughs> That's a, I mean, that's a great comment. Um, the reason it's different is because if I have a Twitter account and I also have a Facebook account, and if I post something on Twitter, my content, and I set it up so that it automatically posts on my Facebook page, I have very similar audiences on those two platforms. Now, I use my platforms differently. Facebook is more for personal use. Twitter is more for my professional identity and professional sharing. But if I'm constantly reposting everything from Twitter onto Facebook, all the people who follow me on Twitter and are also my friends on Facebook are seeing it twice. That's what I was referring to as repeated content. Now, if somebody is repeating, reposting my tweets, like retweeting or sharing my Facebook content, then they're reaching their audiences, which are broader and different than mine. And so that spreads, that's the ripple effect that reposting creates, where I may only have 400 followers on Twitter, but if 10 of those individuals who also have 400 followers, of which maybe a third overlap with mine, you're getting broader and broader reach. Mm -hmm. Another question from our uh, audience. Um, they wanted to know your suggestions on how to communicate uncertainty in communicate, or the, how do we communicate the uncertainty of science in communicating science? Quite often, the public wants to know a yes no, while haven't uh, won't happen. Is the answer is really, for example, um, a small chance a small chance of communicating something happening. And I think the question here is referring to, um, it's often difficult in science to give an absolute num answer to some of these things. Um, how, have you, how have you handled that? Yeah, this is, this is a tough one. It's not really fair that we get to say practicing medicine, we practice medicine, but empirically based science is truth, right? Um, and so at least in medicine, it's like we're trying and this may not be the best, we're practicing. But in science, it's like, if we have evidence, then this is truth and the public does want a yes or no clear cut answer. But the, re the result is, is that when we have new scientific advancement that may go further than what that initial assessment says, then, then we might want to adjust or adapt just the way medicine does. Um, and in this day and age, when technological advancement is happening at such a rapid rate, we're able to test things scientifically that we couldn't 10 years ago. So of course, we're going to have more information available and clearer decisions than we did back then. So yes, this is definitely a difficult space because we don't want to be caught saying this is the truth when there could be some gray space there. That's why we have confidence intervals, right? Um, but we do need to frame our messages in a way that the public can understand that as of right now, with all the information we have available, this is what we believe to be true. And if we are transparent about that, that we are still gonna be working towards it, we're still going to be collecting evidence to, um, 
to confirm or refute that, just like they do in medicine, um, I think we can have a more open and honest dialogue. Um, but that definitely is a challenge with communicating science. Another question we got, and it related back to your, your discussion about the importance of the source. Um, what are the, how do you avoid uh, maybe uh, the, the social status of the source uh, dictating or influencing the validity of the information itself? How do you avoid the social status of the source dictating the validity, the power of the source? Okay. Um, So in this case, I'm going to assume the person asking this question is, is talking about maybe a social media influencer um, or a political leader that has um, social status power um, and therefore uh, is seen as credible despite them maybe not having the scientific knowledge to back up what they are saying. Um, I don't know that we can avoid people of power communicating their thoughts and their experiences uh, in online anymore. I mean, we can't do that. People can share whatever they like in social media spaces. What we can do is proactively put out correct scientific information without engaging in hostile debate. Um, and I do think that that is something that the food industry especially has not always been proactive about transparent communication. Um, putting it at the scientific community, putting the communication piece of our science forward, um, even when it's not asked for, so that it's there, so that it's present when, when someone who has power, who has influence is talking about the topic and people want to learn more about it, the scientific information is there rather than waiting until that moment happens and then refuting it with the science. I think that's our mistake. Yeah. We're getting a lot of great questions and we're not gonna have time to get to all of them, but before we get to the top of the hour, there are a couple that I think it would be interesting to get your take on. Um, as a researcher, what's coming next in consumer focused messaging research? Mm. Well, I can tell you where my research is headed and some areas that I'm really interested in. Obviously, I've done some um, recent data collection around COVID-19 and communicating in times of crisis and how people are consuming scientific information in that space. And I am seeing a lot of research coming out of that space. Um, and I think we'll see more of it. And we can relate a lot of that information to the uh, increase in extreme weather events and the crisis that occurs there, um, the, the wildfires that are related to drought. Um, so I think that we're gonna be seeing quite a bit of movement in that space. One of the areas I am really interested in studying and that I'm seeing emerging is the concept of community and relationship building in social media and what that means for us as communicators and being able to communicate science and build relationships in those new communities. Um, this Gen Z millennial generation spend most of their time um, socializing it and discussing these topics on social media and on, in online spaces. And COVID-19 has only exacerbated that as we can't have face-to-face -face conversations. And so how community is built and how our identity and social norms within those communities uh, influence the way we discuss um, and consume scientific information is gonna be unbelievably important. And so I think, that um, that will be an emerging area of research in science communication. And probably the last question we're gonna have a chance to get to before we have to close out today. But again, we're gonna share all of these questions with, with Dr. Lamb and give her a chance to respond and we'll post them maybe at a later time. But one of the questions talks about how do we measure the impact of our uh, communications efforts, particularly as we look at the use of social media. What, 
from a research standpoint, and when you think about it measuring the effectiveness or the impact that, that messaging is having, what, what guidance would you give to folks in terms of measuring impact or measuring the effectiveness? That's a great question, and it's one that I'm extremely passionate about. Um, anyone who knows me knows that I also have a very strong evaluation background, and I'm really interested in impact assessment to tell the story of our work. Um, of course, the obvious answer to that, the, the capturing in the moment impact of social media is all in analytics. What's being used? Who's it being used by? How is it being shared? Now, the problem with social media analytics is that we can't get at behavior change. We don't know if the consumption, the number of likes, the number of comments, and how that dialogue is occurring is actually influencing what people think, know, feel, and then how that changes their behavior. And it's next to impossible to track that. Um, so social media analytics are there. They are useful. They are helpful in understanding dialogue and how that's occurring. One of the things I've been a strong proponent of for quite some time is, is tracking public perception around agricultural environmental issues. I did that at the University of Florida and I've started doing it at the University of Georgia, continuing that line of inquiry. Because as we implement social media efforts, as we implement communication campaigns around agricultural environmental topics, we need to have a benchmark for where the public started and then to track that over time. How do extreme events, how do crisis influence that public perception in addition to the communication space and what's being discussed, what's out there um, in the media, and then how has that influenced the way that the public thinks and feels? And are our scientists having influence on that public perception? But that takes time. It takes a lot of time to track um, and watch those trends. Uh, so in my mind, that's probably the, the best way for us to track the impact of communication efforts more holistically. Good. And one last question before we go. One of the questions that repeated a couple times. What, what are some good sources, maybe professional journals that some of our scientists that want to learn more about science communication and maybe some things that they ought to be thinking about as they think about improving the effectiveness of it? What are your, what are your suggestions? Yeah, the Journal of Applied Communications is um, one that I publish in regularly and that a lot in the field of agricultural communication publish in. I think it's an excellent place to go um, as a source for some of this information. Um, I also published in the Journal of Environmental Communication um, for more water climate type um, focused research, as well as um, the Journal of Agricultural Education. It has communication oriented research. Um, and then I'm also the executive editor of the Journal for International Agricultural and Extension Education, uh, which has obviously an international focus, but there's a lot of agricultural and environmentally focused communication efforts there, um, in addition to extension education work being displayed in that journal. So I would encourage you to check all of them out and I, I can put together a list that could be shared by CAST as well, if you like, Ken. That would be great. And I have to mention, we did have a couple international visitors that are interested in contacting you because they're, they're seeing the same issue in their country. They could use some yeah. use your expertise in helping them figure that out. Again, thank you, Alexa, for your comments. And again, congratulations on being the uh, named the 2020 Borlaug Cast Communication Award winner. We're very thank pleased you. to have your name to an image to the list of our previous recipients uh, pictured here. Look forward to working with you to enhance communications around the, the science and technology of food and modern agriculture. So again, congratulations. Um, well, also to Thank uh, the Crop Life Foundation for their support of this award. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to work with you to recognize and celebrate outstanding food and agricultural science communicators. Next slide. The uh, nomination materials for the 2021 Borlaug CAS Communication Award will be available soon on the CAS website. Start thinking about others who excel in communicating the importance of science, technology, and innovation and encourage them or nominate them to receive this award. Just a couple closing notes. For those of you who are participating in the Borlaug Dialogue Program, Dr. Lamb will be participating on a panel discussion tomorrow morning 
from 9 to 9.30. She'll have some more thoughts on how we communicate or some of the issues around communication. So please tune in and, and watch that. On Thursday, uh, we will be back releasing a new cast paper on food biofortification, reaping the benefits of science to overcome hidden hunger. Uh, the presentation will be led by Dr. Howard Boyce, the 2016 World Food Prize Laureate, and who will be joined by several other authors who contributed to this paper. And we have one more CAS publication that we'll be releasing in November, uh, November 17th. And this paper is on ground and aero robots in production agriculture opportunities and challenges. And this seminar will be led by Dr. Santos Pila with the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And he will be joined by some members of his task force as well. Again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your time and helping us celebrate and recognize Dr. Uh, Alexa Lamb's accomplishments as the 2020 winner. Have a great day. Thank you.